called Agile um, in Boulder, Colorado. I have been a coach um, at different levels, kind of in different parts of the organization uh, for the last, I don't know, five or seven years now, <laughs> something around there, um, working with INT, but our, you know, tech, um, but then also moving into marketing, working with um, VPs and directors on business agility is really where my passion is lately. Um, but coaching uh, based on my background in conflict resolution has been kind of the heart of what my skill set. So I don't have the background in um, as a developer, but I do have a lot of background in team dynamics and um, healthy conflict to get to better outcomes. So that's me. Uh, let me present my screen to you all so you can, I have some slides. And since it's not too big of a group, I'd love to um, just keep talking as we go and I'll do my best to answer some of the questions you all brought in uh, when we first started talking. So the first thing that I like to pull up is the scaled agile definition of a scrum master. And I highlighted this first sentence because it's really the, the core of what a scrum master is, a servant leader and a coach. Um, those two aspects are the core of everything that we do. Yes, we educate the team, right? And we ensure that agile process is being followed and we remove impediments. But ultimately, the only way we can do that and be successful at that is by being servant leaders and coaches. Um, this comes from Robert Greenleaf, right? Good leaders must first become good servants. We have to learn how to read our teams, see where they are, um, and figure out what, the, what they need, what their best practices are, and how to lead from behind by supporting them. And then I really like this coach, this quote about how coaching is really the universal language of change and learning. We have ideas about what agile practices are, um, what safe might be or whatever your implementation looks like, uh, what those best practices are. But ultimately, we are always leading people through change and we are asking them to be continuous learners. And so when we think of coaching, we have to remember that at, the, at its core, coaching is guiding people through change and learning, which can be a struggle. <laughs> um, so looking at what a lean agile leader is and that mindset required, right? If we are um, coaching people to be continuous learners, then we have to have that growth mindset ourselves, right? We have to first display and lead by example. Um, so a lot of the you know, fundamental pieces of being a coach are having that emotional intelligence to understand what's going on and what people need from you, not necessarily what's written in the book of Agile or the book of SAFE, um, and learning how to grow people from where they are, not necessarily where we want them to be, and leading them through that change. And sometimes I think this upper one, the growth mindset versus fixed mindset is so important too, because it's, we forget sometimes as coaches, we get so fixed on um, what Agile should be, what the practices should be, and we don't realize, oh, that's kind of showing off a fixed mindset um, because I'm not saying, where's this organization? How can we learn and adapt, right? So even as coaches, making sure that we start from the growth mindset if we're going to ask, ask it of others. Um, so one of the, you know, as a coach, when we go into a coaching stance, we have to remember we're not there to answer everybody's questions and be an expert. Coach is not expert. Coach is guiding others to arrive at their own solution and put them into action. And this can be really hard for us as coaches. We want to have the answer as scrum masters. It's like, no, we should be guiding best practices. We should know what they are. We should all be aligned. We should have it. Um, but if we want people to be on board with that, as a coach, we really have to be asking a lot of questions and guiding others to their own solution rather than telling. It's that, that pull, not um, push. So I keep saying this, right? It's about meeting people where they are and not necessarily where we want them to be. And then it's pull, not push. So we can't push it on them. And I think, Asim, you were starting to talk about this a little, right? Some teams might be ready for us and they might be pulling us to support them. And other teams might be really reticent and we might be tempted to push on them. Um, so 
we'll talk a little bit about how do we coach those people without pushing? Because as coaches, it's so important that we keep that pull model and make sure that they're pulling us in to guide them. We are not pushing them before they're ready. Yeah. So um, I'm gonna go through just a couple different aspects of what I think it looks like as a coach. And I'll use examples um, of those times, right? When we might switch from facilitator to coach or those different aspects of when we might use these skills. So the first one's active listening. Um, have you all practiced active listening before or heard the term, hopefully? Uh, yeah, definitely. It's a key to any success. <laughs> yeah. So active listening is easier said than done, right? Because we could say, oh yeah, of course, we're always attentive. Well, we're in a virtual world now and yeah, we might look like we're making eye contact or be making eye contact, but there's also dings and whizzes and tabs open, right? So I find myself bring, bringing back to being attentive to that emotional intelligence of where is the team and what are they saying to me that they need and what are they feeling? Um, and then always, especially if I'm wanting to push them, right? trying to step back and say, what, let me ask an open-ended question instead. And really practicing my open-ended and probing questions to better understand rather than feeling like I have to keep pushing. Um, requ requesting clarification and paraphrasing, right? Always coming back to these basics of, tell me more about that. Instead of, no, you're wrong, I want you to do this. It's, tell me more about how that's getting you what you need or how are you, you know, how are you not getting what you need right now, right? And then reframing it back to them. Okay, what I'm hearing is you, you find this best practice to be a struggle because it's not actually getting you the results, right? So just reminding ourselves to take that step back and um, just listening and guiding them through this. Um, and I find that remote being attuned to and reflecting feelings is also really hard because we can't see the body language necessarily. Um, it's really hard in these group settings. You might not even see everybody's video at the same time, right? So um, reminding ourselves like they are probably struggling with that too. And just always trying to come back and check in the best we can with people's feelings. And then of course, just summarizing kind of where we landed and what we've heard. Um, as a coach, right, we're doing this constantly. And as facilitators, we might be using these skills as well, but in a with a different goal, right? If we're facilitating a retro, we're, st we're, kind we're really trying to get the whole team to come to something on their own. Um, so we might be using all of these skills, but we're way less in invested in the outcome in a retro, right? We're really more invested in the process of Kaizen, where in coaching, we're invested in them finding a path for themselves personally and, and hearing their, themselves. So that's, I would say, the transition in using those same skills to different ends. Um, so other things that I think, um, can make a big difference as coaches, right, is we, um, we have these ceremonies where we're with the whole, whole team, but we also need to coach our POs, right, and our, probably our PMs too, um, and our people managers. And the two ways that I think are best to do this are having those weekly, um, what we call Troika meetings, right, but it's just you meet with the manager, the PO, and yourself, you're the three, a troika is really just a group of three that's pulling this lead, it's a, a Russian term. Um, meeting on that weekly cadence to make sure you're aligned, to give each other feedback and to coach one another. Um, Cause we as coaches need to make sure that those other leaders are coaching us as we coach them. And we need to create that safe space and have that cadence with that group. And similarly, we wanna have weekly one-on-ones with each of those people so that we create, again, that expectation of giving and asking for feedback and making sure that we're aligned. Hey, do you feel like I'm pushing? Do you see places where someone needs my coaching? How is that? How is the coaching working for you and for them, right? And really just keeping that cadence of checking in and giving each other feedback. It's so easy to let drop off because we always feel like we have so many meetings and we also just, especially I think in COVID, right, we're on screens constantly. I've heard a lot of people say they're dropping these meetings to get time back. And I really just think that's a mistake because it's such important coaching time. Um, it's not, you know, your typical 
scrum master list of duties or your facilitation work, but it, I think it is as important to making sure that your, your team is on the right track. Oops. Um, so feedback, let's just talk about what feedback looks like. Um, as coaches, we should be creating this culture of feedback and we should be using it constantly. I mean, I've, most of our conversations should probably involve this and certainly at the end of meetings that other people run or events that happen, we should be offering this fast feedback to those running those meetings or making those decisions. Um, so some key parts of right, giving good feedback and creating a trustful context are always being specific, sincere, timely, and offering help. Um, so as a coach, we need to, we need to make sure um, we're not saying, hey, you always do this, or hey, you know, this didn't work. We have to be really specific of um, when you opened the meeting that way, I felt the energy in the room shift. I understand you were trying to get the energy to go a certain way. Let, I'd love to help you plan the next facilitation, right? So I've, I've been specific, I've been sincere. Ideally, I've given that feedback within a couple of days of that, that meeting that they held. And then I've offered them help moving forward of, as your coach, I'm also here to walk you through improving that later. And then we need to ask for feedback, especially as facilitators who are constantly running meetings and working on um, coaching teams through things. We need to constantly be asking for feedback, saying, I would really like you to give me feedback on how I'm doing, on what you think the team needs. And even if we disagree with it, we have to make sure that we thank them for that feedback and create the safe space and follow up with, you know, I appreciate your feedback. I'm not sure if I'm ready for that step here's what I'm gonna do next, or I appreciate that feedback, I'd love your help implementing it to the next meeting, right? But just creating that pattern um, in giving and receiving feedback creates a culture of coaching and accepting coaching, right? So instead of, we're not pushing our coaching on people, but we are creating this culture that naturally asks for coaching. We're creating a cycle of feedback which will inherently make people feel safe enough to pull in that, that coaching and support. Um, so coaching for high performance and culture and team dynamics. So I think this is probably where we see blurring of facilitator and coach, right? Because it is so important for us to um, use the meetings and the facilitations that we put on, right, to, and create processes that allow for data sharing, that create this culture of positive intent, um, that, that invite people to participate and engage in our ceremonies, right? That's very much, that's very much Scrum Master as facilitator. But as a coach, we need to recognize when someone is hoarding data or not sharing in that, you know, in good faith or if someone's not you know, following through with positive intent or participating. And that's when we would pull off into those one-on-one -on -one more like coaching scenarios where we would, we would pull those people out. When we're in our facilitation stance, um, we're really showing by doing. So there is, you know, there's some coaching in there, but it's not really active coaching. We're much more um, facilitating people through a process to get them somewhere more than we're saying, I'm here to get you to a specific place. Because as facilitator, we need to be more about the process and less about the outcome. Um, so I just, I like to, you know, these are some of the hot topics, certainly for my teams in recent history, um, and areas that I always find there's at least someone on the team that's got something where they need coaching in this, in this direction. Um, so this is just sort of the list, but um, certainly pairing and building T skills too is when we encourage them to do that, right? And coach them to do those types of work in that way. Um, you're going to see that personal, personal growth and continuous learning, even if they're not um, necessarily saying 
I want to share my work, they might be saying, I do want to collaborate with my colleagues. So there's sort of those sideways of, okay, you are pulling me in this area and I can, I can coach you to high performance through that channel. Um, oops. Cool. Um, so coach as servant leader, um, I think these are two really big ones. We talk about how we have, as the scrum masters especially, um, teams need to have goals and objectives and we're always eliminating impediments. So we should be um, facilitating people to set and align on goals and ruthlessly, pr ruthlessly prioritize, but then we need to coach them through those difficult conversations of prioritization because those, I find those conversations to be the most contentious uh, for my teams, right? We all have our things that we think are the most important or we just can't do it all. Um, so coaching them through goal, goals and objective setting and creating the space for conflict that gets you to a better outcome. Um, that's another one you need to plan and facilitate the process, but you also need to coach people on what it means to be uncomfortable and to get to that, that better outcome of that goal. Um, and then in eliminating impediments, it's really just the act of doing, right? We're still showing by doing. We're saying, I am going to go take care of this for you. I am going to go work with the art level. Um, I am going to go support the RTE with the higher level ceremonies and make sure that we're getting what we need out of them. And that's really that leading by doing. I'm just going to go and I'm going to make sure that the path around you is what you need as a team. Um, so that's really all like I, I all I had is my initial um, thoughts there. We do have scrum uh, safe has two different classes that touch on this a lot. Um, the advanced scrum master and implementing safe. Um, so both really great, um, ex, you know, extra resources. And then um, I'd love to just have a conversation with you all from that. Just any questions or anything you want to dig deeper into. Um, or even just specific examples you have at your work that you want to talk about. Thanks, Lucien. So if you have any question, you can go directly and ask or put it in the chat. Yeah, and I'll check both. And I can go back to other slides if that helps or whatever. So you, you started by, um, uh, if you go to the first couple of slides that you, you mentioned, um, when you speak, the next slide, if you don't mind, um, when you speak about the next one, when you speak about um, how coaching is a big part and being a coach and being a servant leader together. Now, the character of a coach is someone who is not really telling you. Um, the problem with being an agile coach that you are an SME and you are a coach. So how to step in and out from mentoring and coaching, coaching and mentoring. Um, it's different from any other coaching job that you would ever do. Yeah. Yeah, that is a good point. It's just because we are guiding them to their own path doesn't mean we're not an expert who certainly could tell them the answer, right? <laughs> um, and this one's been really hard for me recently working with a lot of business teams because you know, when I, especially working at Scaled Agile, it's like, well, this is what we do, right? This is what we teach others to do. Um, what do you mean it doesn't work for you? Like, let me tell you how to do it, right? This, we have a stated best practices on our website. What do you mean you're not going to do it? Um, and I think that's where it's knowing the answer and being able to say, you know, in an ideal world, we're working towards this. And as a subject matter expert, I'm telling you that we're working towards this and here's why. But as a coach, I want to know in the short term how something along that path can serve you in your need. So I think it's still in the same conversation very often. And I, I will call it out to people. I will just say, the expert in me is going to tell you this. But the me that knows where you're at on your journey wants to ask some more questions and really understand your immediate need. It's not and come to an agreement on what we're going to do. 
um, but, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Sylvia. Okay, but if I may, um, have you ever thought of giving them the choice? Because sometimes I'll give them the choice. Of do you what? want the well I'll tell them. Do you want the let's call it best practice expert answer? Or do you want me to ask you questions so you can figure it out and yeah. maybe adapt to your context? Because the thing that it helps me to address is do I have someone who basically wants me to chew it for him or her? Yeah. Or do I want someone who really wants to grow and change? Yeah. Well, and I think if it's someone that wants you to chew it for them. There's a lot more to unpack there too, right? <laughs> yeah, but, and the only reason sometimes I will offer, especially if we're pressed for time, okay, mm -hmm. and it's going to kind of get out of hand or, you know, mm -hmm. we'll dwell on it for too long. And I will say in the essence of time, which route do you want to go? Yeah, okay. I think that's now, a good approach. Yeah, and if somebody tells me I want to learn more, but I feel too pressured or too stressed or the commitment or, you know, whatever pressure from their their uh, line manager then i'll say you know what okay let's go with this let's take it apart and then we'll work on it after where the when the pressure is down mm -hmm. and we have time to look at other alternatives and then we'll and i use this as some sort of a little you know scrum coaching one-on-one -on -one session mm -hmm. yeah one time i did run into with one team they always chose be the expert and tell me what to do and they hated it but it was always the choice they chose and so after a while i had to just say i don't think that's what you actually want that's right yeah <laughs> you keep saying that's what you want but your reaction is telling me that is not what you actually want so i'm yeah. not gonna do it anymore yeah i think down to Sylvia's point we are always in the tiny of urgency if we didn't put the time aside to do so um, I think it's different from um, industry to industry. Mainly when you are in consulting, you know that you are with this team temporary. And um, as a coach, I would say, um, your, your, um, how good you are is reflected by how sufficient the team is after you leave them. Yeah. I don't know, Lashin, yeah. you have any... Yeah, I think in that case, I often look for a person that I can just really lean on someone mm -hmm. who really wants to step into that role and can handle me just like laying it out for them, right? And being really just blunt and honest about the journey ahead. And then I, then I can trust that that person will at least try to carry it forward if, and that way they're kind of ahead of the rest of the team. Yeah. And so when you have to leave them, at least you feel like you've left it in good hands. That's right. And, and I will sometimes have the conversation with the client too. Okay. My goal is also to make sure that once I leave here, you don't regress. Mm -hmm. So if I keep chewing it out for you, nobody's going to learn here. Yeah. Right? Uh, because we're going down the easy path. Plus it is also proven irrespective of what, which, which setting you're at is that if you participate and it's the same in school. If your own learning and your own learning and development, you retain a lot more mm -hmm. and you will grow and be curious a lot more. But if it's always handed to you on a plate, it's like, yeah, it's easy. Why should I bother? So when the consultant leaves, it's, that's human nature. When the consultant leaves, it's like, oh, shoot, what do we do now? And I was actually thinking that's a benefit for you because you were talking about people coming in from where they've done agile in a different country or in a different, a different industry or wherever. And it's, I think that's almost a blessing because then you're, you're primed to have those harder conversations earlier, right? Of, of Absolutely. you know, okay, we've yeah. seen this two different ways. What do, how, what do we want to do here and now? Absolutely. No? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's and, those hard conversations that I think we always want to avoid because it can be so, you know, they feel core to us, right? We've based our job around doing it in a certain way and believing that to be best. But I think we come out the other end of those difficult conversations much more aligned and confident. Yeah. And plus, as I said, there's a lot of learnings that you can gain from. And in a client setting, then that could benefit the client. Yeah. Because a big, and um, for those of you who are uh, from Canada, um, La Presse, which is our 
you know, very well-known French-speaking Montreal-based newspaper, just to give you some context, um, was one of the first papers that went totally digital, okay? Mm -hmm. And actually, I think uh, the Toronto Sun came back to us in Montreal to say, help us and show us how to do it. So the context is as follows. And this is a newspaper where the journalists and all the folks on the printing press were unionized. So as they were going through the digital transformation, they were being, pardon my expression, clobbered mm. on the press and in the market because they knew ultimately there would be layoffs. And mm. in essence, it's been fully digital for three, four years now. It went gradually, but the reason I'm giving you the context is the person who was responsible for the transformation at the onset was really, like, I mean, you know, he was not a very popular person. And at one point he's giving a speech and they had outside consultants helping them as well, an internal team, outside consultants. And as I said, they were being clobbered in their own newspaper. I mean, that's how bad it was. But he made one point and he did that fully agile. And he said, the day that I realized that my job was to give the right context to my teams yeah. and then tell them, given that context, what do you think we should do? Yeah. Let's put our heads together. He says, it went wonderfully well. And that's a great example of Scrum Master as facilitator, right? We need to, setting the context and ensuring that everybody understands it so that they can get through the process and come out the other side. Correct. Um, so, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, I, and it yeah. was, I said, it was even worse because every time something that displeased either, you know, the workers from the press or the journalist who knew full well at one sure. point, he was, I mean, you know, they were writing on it uh, in, in the print and, and, and on the web. But and I think that's when people know that change is coming, right? And it's almost like, we're trying to coach them through being willing to learn and change, but it might be really scary and not feel safe because of layoffs or restructuring or whatever. You know, how do we get them to focus on the right things and then walk them through it, which definitely is more, um, you know, Scrum Master as facilitator because it is so much of getting through that whole change process. Correct. And, yeah. and it, today it's one of the best success in the world of a newspaper that went fully digital. Mm -hmm. You know, but the key word to him, he says, the minute I told him, this is the context, this is a reality, we can't change it. Yeah. Um, but how do we move forward? How do we put our brains together? How do we collectively work? And he said, after that, he said, they were just, you know, he said, the momentum was amazing. So, and so, we do, I think as, I mean, as Scrum Masters, we're always fighting the, that phrase of this is how we've always done it. Mm -hmm. As coaches, we're always fighting, well, this company is 100 years old and we've always done it this way, right? Like, well, we're, we're digital now, so clearly we haven't always done it that way. And no, and, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm sure you've heard, um, you know, and we use it quite a bit here, the acronym VUCA, Volatility, yeah. and sort of, you know, um, look at the world today and, and in reality with the pandemic and look at the world in February, <laughs> completely different. You know, and then in after the pandemic, it'll be something else. It could be geopolitical, it could be anything. So the context, the comprehension of it, um, having all the asking all the right questions on the context, making sure it's clarified, making sure everybody's on the same page. People will figure it out if you give them, you know, the right, as I said, the right tools, the right context. I think one of the other big coaching moves kind of in any you know, VUCA or right change scenario um, is that people that aren't engaged or aren't pulling, if they, when they complain about something, right, or want to change something, it's always such a good opportunity as a coach to be able to step in and say, okay, how is what you're currently doing fixing that for you? Yep. And of course it's not. <laughs> but I just feel like those are great opportunities as a coach to say, okay, how might I help you approach this differently so that you are less frustrated. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Where do you see the value? Where's your why? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, because sometimes we lose sight of that. We're so bogged down on the details and the delivery that we kind of lose track of that. Yeah. But um, very often I will say, 
are we all aligned on the why here? And I look at the body language, and if I see people, you know, like their head sideways or frowning, I'm like, oh, okay, we need to reset the why here. I think about coaching kind of up the hill too, like as a scrum master, when you're a scrum master, coaching an RTE to say, hey, I'm not sure you're seeing what's happening at the team level here, or that context you set, you know, for planning, I, I, I'm seeing a different level of it and doing that, some of that coaching up to the RTE to help them really understand the, the broader context because they're often so busy in a totally different context. Correct. Um, being able to coach them and give them feedback on a regular basis can make yep. a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to shut up. Other people can jump in. I'm going on mute now. <laughs> uh, that was a really interesting topic to discuss on. So yeah, I would like to uh, actually, uh, could you be more elaborate on the push and pull um, Oh, sure. Method? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so when I uh, think about pushing and pulling, or do you have a specific example you want to talk about? No, uh, actually, I wanted to do, know about from your experience about the context or the scenario uh, where there might be some failures and that could have been like push or that could be a pull. Mm -hmm. um, what are the contexts to it exactly? It would be more beneficial and what are the actual keys to identify them and then switch back to those um, push and pull techniques? I, well, in the example I was using earlier, that team that kept asking me to be the expert and tell them what to do, I realized that they, they knew they were being asked to change but they weren't actually ready to. And so they were really asking me to push them, but they didn't like it and they pushed back, right? Mm -hmm. Because they were always saying, be the expert, answer my questions. And then I, that was a really hard time for me because you know, they had, that team had interviewed and hired me and said they wanted that, right? And they, they laid out what they wanted to do. And then it just really turned out that wasn't true. They just knew it was the right thing to say because their leaders wanted them to do it. And mm -hmm. I think in transformations, especially as consultants, we run into that all the time, right? You go in and it's like, oh, well, we didn't actually pull you in. Management did. Management told us we were making this change. Yeah. Um, and so I had to, and honestly, we're still moving a lot slower now than I wanted to be moving, but I had to step back and really slow down the change I was asking them to make and spend a lot more time saying, what would make your life better today? What's your number one problem to solve? Mm -hmm. What's the, you know, where's the bottleneck in your life and in your work? And saying, okay, I'm not gonna force you to improve in those other areas. I'm gonna just focus on this for you until you're comfortable, right? And sometimes I feel like I'm not doing enough and I feel slow and I, you know, whatever. But it has made such a big difference in my relationship with them and even just being totally honest with them, I am not, you know, I'm not going to push you. You have to tell me you're ready. And here's some of the ways that I've noticed you telling me you're ready. You know, you start talking about how um, you're the only person that can do certain work and you're really asking other people to learn. Okay, great. Now we're ready to do some coaching on shared stories and pairing and getting through that great. Oh, and you're, and because it's your main source of heartburn right now, because you were the one who came to me with the problem, suddenly you're bought into that solution. Mm -hmm. And then they pulled me in and they feel the value of my coaching. And then the next time they have heartburn, they won't wait so long. They won't wait till it gets as painful as the last thing did. They'll pull me in a little earlier where when I was pushing, it was like, Oh God, if I say anything to her, she's just going to push on me again. And it's this mm -hmm. dread, right? Um, so, so yeah, that's my most recent example. <laughs> okay. Because I, I had that similar similar experience. I was actually facil I was supporting two teams. One of them uh, were yeah different team dynamics. Some um, the one team was really into pull mode, uh, and the other was was more mostly into push because we started at the same time, um, transitioning to agile. And then since coaching is in the initial days will be mostly. Um, uh, telling them what or clarifying what exactly and um, being an agile is uh, so some teams could grasp that quickly and then be more mature and then move on to the next step of being more 
full approach they try to figure themselves out rather than some teams they always feel to be guided so that was my dilemma earlier so yeah i got to got to you know, clarify some people, yeah sometimes the people that won't that aren't pulling you in need to see the success of others mm -hmm. and realize that they're falling behind before they pull you and oh, with, yeah. with any change there's you know a solid 15 percent of people that are just going to wait until the absolute last minute to pull and there's 15 to 20 percent that are going to be so excited you're there and pull you because they love all the new things all the time yeah that that, that, that actually resonates uh, because uh what my approach was was i used to share the metrics mm -hmm. team's metrics on how uh, being transparent and showing what exactly and how we are doing as a team and that actually eventually made that team to be more uh, mature and feel like we can actually progress more rather than being stagnant in our current efficiency so yeah and that's a great move right using your um using your ceremonies that you have anyway to just say like i'm just gonna leave this here i'm okay. not gonna tell you what to do with it i'm gonna t i'm not gonna tell you what this number means i just want you to look at it okay and okay. you tell yeah, me that's a good approach you, yeah. you tell me what it means to you you tell me mm. what it says about what you're feeling in your work every day yeah okay that's kind of re reverse thinking yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and this is a question that and reflecting on both conversation together, um, uh, sometimes you as a consultant, you don't have this luxury to wait for people to come to you. It's not really about doing the job for them. So how you as a consultant um, will do that? And um, I think also one of the things that's always um, worried about that you're stepping out of your role as a coach to do some job as a scrum master, as uh, an RTE, while it's different. You can do it, that's not a matter of fact, but the idea is you're stepping out of something to do something else. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. any reflection on those two situations? So invitation based is great, but it do not always work. You have job to do at the end of the day. Yeah. I would say finding someone in the organization, someone who's there permanently, um, you know, at that, maybe it's your head of engineering, right? Or your um, architects or um, someone at another level who can understand the team in a different way it's like the, they aren't ready and we want to move faster and i you know i understand that for budget reasons and uh burning platform or whatever it is you feel the need to move faster here are the ways in which moving faster is actually going to harm that transformation in the long run and cause regression so i think it's a lot of setting real expectations with the leaders in that organization and those who brought you in um, so that they realize, okay, this is going to take a little longer. And even if I can't keep the consultants longer, I need to give them the room to create internal champions in a different way than they are now. And by stepping out of that role to go do the role of Scrum Master and RTE, I'm not creating that space. And as a consultant, I say, this is the trade-off you're making when you make that decision, right? So just really setting expectations and having those difficult conversations, which when they're the ones paying you can be a very difficult thing to do. <laughs> Um, yeah. And often their expectations are unrealistic. So helping, it's also maybe a slower path than you would want for helping them understand what realistic looks like. That's a dodgy, that's a scary path actually. It's so hard. Yeah. Yeah. Has anyone uh, read or heard about, um, the book by Lencioni about dysfunctional teams. Yeah. Okay. The five dysfunctions of a team. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's a good tool. I'm, I'm a strong advocate, especially with the client. And if I see that there are some dysfunction in the team, as opposed to being the expert, I will rely on some of the best books out there to kind of nudge the client and say, hmm, 
when was the last time you had HR assessed, you know, the, the, the composition of your team? What made you decide to put this team together? Okay. Was it a skill set thing? Was it a personality? Um, you was know, it an accident? Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, did, did, did it happen because you had no choice? That helps you a lot to determine, okay, there was a reflection there in building that team, or it was just a matter of we have, you know, a, a, an urgent project, um, you know, and this we had, this was the, be the best skill sets that we had. Have they ever worked together before? Are they all new to the team? Blah, 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 blah. But using, I, I, use, I love this book because to uh, your point to, I think, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name properly, Asim? Yes. If, when you begin this book, it tells you that, and I, you know, I've read this book about 10, 15 years ago, but essentially any individuals who will be told by their doctor that either, you know, they need to stop smoking because they're going to die of emphysema or lose weight because their heart is going to, you know, fail. Any medical condition that needs to be addressed because if not, the outcome will be grave. I think it's less than 20% who will, of people who will basically intrinsically react and say, oh shit, I need to do something. Mm -hmm. So the point of the author is like, if your life is not in danger at work, how the heck are you going to be motivated to change? Mm -hmm. So some people are basically set in their ways mm -hmm. because it's not in their mindset. It's not in their mindset to lose weight, to save their heart, let mm -hmm. alone at work. My life's not in danger. And then, and I will put a, a, a caveat to that because I, I, one of the mandate I worked on just prior to the pandemic, I won't name the company, but those of you in Toronto will know who it is, is our late, la, uh, largest hydro producer in Quebec. Most of these people are unionized. Mm -hmm. They have no desire whatsoever to change. Yeah. None whatsoever. So you have this context where basically you need to kind of, you know, and, and I'm not trying to be negative. It again, it's being utilizing the context and being pragmatic about how you're going to work with these people. It's sort of, yeah. And it's all about what's in it for them and stepping back and getting them to say, correct this is what I need or what I want. And then just showing how, you know, agile can fix that problem correct. because correct. you're not selling agile. You're selling a more enjoyable workplace. You're selling correct. success in the workplace. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And, and, you know, um, as I said, the one in Toronto know who I'm talking about, but, and when I was there it was still Eric Martel who left and is now at Bombardier and uh, Sophie Brochu who was the CEO of Energy or natural um, gas uh, company took over at Hydro Quebec. But the case in point is at one point Eric Martel had told them, if we are unable to innovate clean tech, and other small companies at one point will basically come and have us for breakfast. And yeah. because they were, because they were a monopoly in the, and I'm a role, I was working for a consultant who had, who um, won the tender to provide all the training, not only to IT, but all to, to all the lines of business so that they can ensure that they have the same language yeah. because everything is, you know, even though they're distributing electricity, Everything is driven by technology. So, and at one point we had a video that we showed them and some of them who had, who endorsed Eric Martel were like, yeah, we get it. Some of them were like, no, 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 it's never going to happen. Until I told them, because I come from the, the um, uh, startup sector, I said, we have amazing technology emanating from Waterloo, Toronto and Vancouver on the clean tech side that guys, if you don't step up, they're going to eat you for breakfast. Mm -hmm. Oh, golly gee whiz. Yeah. You know, and you may be close to retirement, but if you want this company to exist for future generations, oh, we never thought of that. When I thought of, there was another, I think it was Patrick Lencioni who, who also talks about, it can be very hard because people with a certain set of skills got to the level of success they have. And it can be very difficult for them to even believe that a new set of skills will get them to the next place, right? Because they're so comfortable and confident in the set of skills they currently use in the process that they currently use, especially when we're working with like leadership teams, right? 
well, I didn't get to be a CEO by using Agile. I got there by waterfall and telling people what to do. What do you mean you want me to change that? You know, <laughs> I, I'm under a lot of pressure, I'm under a lot of pressure to deliver. And you want me to try something I've never been successful with before. Correct. It's very scary for them. Correct. Yeah, that, that all depends upon the risk taking culture that a company yeah. 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 adapts to. Yeah. Yeah, but I kind of digress. But the point is, is that people have a hard time accepting change, even if their life depends on it. Yeah, you know. So you that's agree. my point. Yeah. So when you know, when <laughs> employers tell you, "Well, why won't my, you know?" And I've had executives who tell me, "Well, why won't they change?" It's like, buddy, you know, some of them need to change because their heart is gonna, they're gonna go in heart well, failure, and <laughs> and they're not. So you need to put things back into perspective. Not everybody is in that mindset. And I, I, I was having a conversation on, a, on an interview. Sorry? I was gonna say, I liked your point about team dynamics because that's a great time to be able to go to your you know, director of engineering or whoever and say, I've got one team that's sprinting ahead doing amazing with this agile stuff and another team that's really struggling. Here's how I think we might consider altering the dynamics of our team. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, forward. And and there's and I'll close on that because I'm going to have to go unfortunately. But I love the discussion. There's an amazing book by uh, her last name escapes me, and I'm I'm going to kill myself because I know her. Linda Rising. Okay? okay. More fearless change. I think it's now available in PDF for free. Linda oh. had written this book prior to social media, so 2004, 2005. She rewrote it probably 2014, 2015. But one other thing, and she's got a PhD in a branch of IT I didn't even know existed. She's from the States, but she comes to Montreal and Canada quite often. But in that book at one point, when you talk about team dynamics, because she's a PhD, all her books are published after she's done research. And because she's well known on the planet, what she'll do is she'll have these ideas. She calls her former clients and say, okay, I'm doing this book. I have these ideas. I want to do research. Can I, can I use you as guinea pig? And the client mm -hmm. will usually say yes. So she comes out with these amazing research. And one of the things she has discovered is that for team dynamics, once you introduce a change, if you have people who are, let's, I'm going to be polite here, reluctant. Yeah. Okay. Bring them on board, ask them why they're reluctant and ask them to share that with the world. Yeah. Be open about it. And then take your early adopter, your cheerleader, who's like, yeah, we can do this. Match them together. Mm -hmm. Because once the reluctant has understood what motivates the early adopter, the one who's inclined to change and he buys into it, he becomes your best ambassador. Yeah. <laughs> But she, her That's point different. is, don't don't hide it. Be upfront about it. Yeah. Why won't you endorse this? Yeah, and it'll make you stronger for it because you're responding to that person and you're saying you're part of this and you're making us better by correct. Writing. And we need to listen to you because maybe there are some valid points that we didn't see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the, as I said, if that book's available on PDF, if not, I'm sure it's you know fairly cheap. But she's got amazing tips that I call very, en français, on dit pratico-pratique, very practical, <laughs> okay, to bring and to enhance the team dynamics in any change setting. Obviously, she's an, uh, you know, she's a, uh, an agile endorser for many years, but she's tried to remain as agnostic as possible because they're good for any type of changes in organizations. And mm -hmm. on this note, I got to go, sorry, yeah, but it was you. an amazing That's conversation. Great. Yeah, thank Thanks you so me. much. Okay, take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, we I are. We are pretty much discuss, And I think uh, just one point, Sylvia, before you go, I think this is a motive because um, this is what Dean tell us. This is what Safe tell us that the tipping point, you need that urgent. I recall, uh, I worked back time with uh, Nicole, uh, uh, Nicole Dumpy's, uh, I'm not sure if the last name also it, it, with me. So she was saying actually, when there is no nothing really, the only way we create internal crisis in order to get leaders to believe that the urge to, to change. So I think kind of this sense of urgent, especially in this age, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. So yeah. 
Sylvie, what was the name of the book again? I want to put it in the chat for everyone. Yeah. More, more Fearless Change. Linda Rising. Thank you. It, it reads, as I said, it reads very well. A lot of good tips. Um, Linda is extremely accessible. So if you have questions, uh, you know, on her website, LinkedIn, she answers them. Uh, but yeah, they're very, very good tips. And, um, and as I said, always proven with research. So I love that because she'll come up and say, okay, I've tried it. Here are the results. Here are what I found. Um, so to, again, in a, a consulting setting, it's a lot easier to sell. Why? Because, and she's an expert. The woman, I think, is, I don't know, 74, 75. She still travels around the world and give conferences. Um, and she is a very strong advocate of what the agile mindset is, not only in a professional setting, but in the personal setting as well. So, so there's a lot of tips on the team dynamics just by putting basically the right, I don't like the word attributes, but personality traits uh, to mesh together so that you have your optimal team. Okay? Awesome. It was a joy, a pleasure. I got to go. Okay. And, uh, and now you have the floor. I don't talk anymore. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for attending. Thanks a lot, Machine. Yeah. For being here for, with everyone, uh, I'll thank, be watching the recording after after a while. Thank, thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone. That was, I know I haven't contributed this time, but that was a very that was a great discussion. Thank you very much. Well, good. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Well, ha thank you for being here either way. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.